Part two, beyond the control society, COVID-19 as pan-endemic. Peter Zendi, for his part, attempts a less sensationalist appropriation of Foucauldian motifs than the one articulated by Agamben. Zendi begins his rather more cautious, let us say more scholastically Foucauldian essay, Viral Times, by remarking upon the radically different temporalities set in motion by the onset of the pandemic, temporalities which he labels standstill and hypervelocity. In recognition of the way in which the crisis of the pandemic takes place in the context of an already unfolding climate catastrophe, Zendi refers to the satellites which show the sky cleansed of polluting emissions over China, Milan, or Paris, a consequence of unforced immobility, no doubt, but at the same time, he also notes, our immobility prompts a large mobilization, and thus the two extremes of standstill and hypervelocity somehow belong together. Having made this initial point about temporalities, he proceeds to make an argument about neoliberalism and about the destruction of animal habitats, both of which have emerged as rather recurrent tropes in the more critical social, scientific, and political philosophical literature quite frantically produced in response to the pandemic, as we will have ample chance to witness. The point about neoliberalism, as expressed by Zendi, a French philosopher writing from Brown University in Rhode Island, is that, quote, decades of neoliberal dismantling of health and research infrastructures, as we knew, could only lead to a foreseeable catastrophe. Likewise, with the point about what he labels the inexorable destruction of animal habitats, which he contends has for a long time increased the risk of zoonoses, uh, those passages of a virus from one species to another. For Zendi, this too is unsurprising. In his words, nothing new befell us. Rather, a process we knew well without wanting to recognize it suddenly crystallizes before our eyes. The pandemic thus arrives, arrives to jolt us out of a trance, to wake us up and shake us out of our state of collective denial. Zendi then comes to explicitly address Foucault. He starts by tracing briefly how the rise of the technique of biopolitics was somehow associated with an increasing focus on endemics, more so than the concern, even obsession, in the medieval era of classical sovereignty with epidemics. Foucault taught us, Zendi contends, that forms of disease and technologies of power are interrelated, indeed co-implicated, which brings Zendi to a question which, he claims, seems to be on everyone's lips today, even in silent or unheard ways. This question turns out to be rather complicated, and Zendi articulates it in four parts. He first asks, what is the coronavirus contemporary with? As if that weren't difficult enough to understand, he then adds, or rather, what is the metonymy or synecdoche? What is it the metonymy or synecdoche of? Metonymy, by the way, means the substitution of the name of an attribute or adjunct for that of the thing meant, for example, suit for business executive, or the turf for horsing race. Likewise, synecdoch means a figure of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole or vice versa, as in England lost by six wickets, meaning the English cricket team. So in, so in other words, Zendi is asking, what is the coronavirus an attribute of? What whole does it represent? More specifically, Zendi goes on to pose the question, that is to say, to what regime or to what technology of power does it attach itself with the spikes of its crown? And finally, most precisely, he comes to the point, what is the organism or organization of power, sovereign, disciplined, or biopolitical that hosts it and is systematically related to it? In order to answer these interrelated questions, Zendi claims that we need to understand two further preliminary points about biopolitics and the birth of biopower. On the one hand, he insists, we have to consider that among the domains or fields of intervention that appeared in the late 18th century with the birth of biopolitics, there is what Foucault calls the control over the relations between human beings insofar as they are a species, insofar as they are living beings, and their environment. Ecology, Zendi thus sums up, is also contemporary with biopower. Having made this first preliminary point, Zendi proceeds to invoke, on the other hand, Gilles Deleuze, who in 1990 produced an extension of the Foucauldian biopolitical analysis in a famous postscript on control societies in which he suggests setting up a correspondence between any society and some kind of machine. 
According to Zendi, what Deleuze calls control societies, a generalization of disciplines and biopower outside their institutional walls and even into the micro pores of the social fabric is for him the era of viral contamination par excellence. Zendi is now ready to repose the question, this time phrased in three parts. What about the coronavirus then? What kind of society hosts it? And what nosological political paradigm would it belong to? Nosology, by the way, means the branch of medical sciences dealing with the classification of diseases. To which Zendi finally responds in full by pointing out first that epidemi epidemiologists expect COVID-19 to become a new seasonal disease, which for Zendi should lead one to wonder, according to the Foucauldian distinction, whether we are dealing with an epidemic or an endemic. He then lays out a third option in which we are rather facing the resurgence of an epidemic temporality from the very heart of the endemic homeostasis or steady state regulated by biopolitics. What this means, according to Zendi, is that we are facing a contamination that can no longer be contained within the distinction between epidemics and endemics, a contamination that contaminates these categories themselves, the one by the other. As a result, Zendi argues, what we could well witness is a pandemic that would be contemporary neither with past societies of sovereignty, of course, nor with disciplinary societies and their biopolitical developments, nor even with the Deleuzian forms of control that prolong them, a supersession of the Foucauldian paradigm then perhaps. And one which brings him back to his point about neoliberal capitalism, for he insists, after becoming pandemic, the epidemic could end up endemic, though still punctuated by epidemic peaks. And he goes on to add crucially, but the reverse is also true. The endemic plague of healthcare systems under capitalism has exploded into a pandemic crisis. The latter is the subject of permanent statistical monitoring, of course, but it seems to thwart insurantial preparation and regulatory controls. The coronavirus pandemic thus puts the Foucauldian paradigm to rest, according to Zendi. Indeed, he adds in an explicitly Derridian vein, I would be inclined to say that these paradigms are put in crisis if the event called coronavirus did not overflow even the category of crisis itself. In a word, we are beyond crisis, Cindy contends. As he puts the point, the very notion of crisis is still part of what it puts in crisis. By determining the threat as a crisis, one tames it, domesticates it, neutralizes it. Here he is quoting the eminent deconstructionist Jacques Derrida, who responded along such lines when questioned back at the beginning of the neoliberal period in 1983, whether the world was in crisis. The idea of crisis, Zendi suggests, leaves us with too much hope. Again, in Zendi's formulation, the crisis, especially when it is endemic, is already the horizon for a way out of the crisis. This is why what Derrida could add, in its turn in crisis, the concept of crisis would be the signature of a last symptom, the convulsive effort to save a world that we no longer inhabit. In some, for Zendi, like Derrida, there would appear to be no way out of the present predicament, a point which should be read in relation to his very first observation about the parenthesis of the clean sky, as well, of course, as in relation to the related point about the co-implication of the rise of ecology with the birth of biopower. Then there is the matter of promises and commitments made by governments in response to the pandemic. Zendi registers clear skepticism on these fronts. He mentions, for example, the promise that he admits would have been unthinkable a few months ago of resuscitating a dying public health system, only to quickly add, it remains to be seen whether these promises will be kept. The signs are not encouraging. He also refers to what he calls the more or less tacit commitments that are being made regularly, for example, about the temporary and exceptional nature of the mass surveillance measures deployed or currently experimented with only to likewise add, here too, everything is ready and everything remains to come. Finally, Zendi ends his essay on a note of further skepticism. The best case scenario, he suggests, would be that the coronavirus ends up being just one more crisis, perhaps more memorable than others. But this, he contends, remains to be seen and above all to be decided, a decision he adds ominously that must be taken now, but also subsequently again and again and again. The moral of the story in some, we find ourselves trapped even beyond the control society, now facing a scenario that eclipses the Foucauldian paradigm altogether with the rise of the pan-endemic in the age of the Anthropocene 
immersed in a crisis of the very concept of crisis, very likely extinguished the very last glimmer of hope towards a universal right to breathe. In his dense but very important 2003 essay, Necropolitics, Achille Mbembe had proposed his own extension of the Foucauldian paradigm of biopolitics in which he, build on, he built on, emphasized, and adapted the link between the emergence of biopower and the rise of state racism. The notion of necropolitics that he coined was in reference to the walking dead, as Wikipedia summarizes the argument. Uh, Mbembe there proposed a way of analyzing how contemporary forms of subjugation of life to the power of death for some bodies to remain located between life and death. Near the outset of the pandemic back in March, Mbembe would pen from South Africa an eloquent essay explicitly articulating the demand for a universal right to breathe, while at the same time implicitly seeking to demonstrate, at least in part, the continuing relevance of the necropolitical and biopolitical interpretive lens. Mbembe begins his essay by situating himself as a spokesperson for the global majority, while striking a distinctly prophetic chord about terrible times ahead. He writes, for most of us, especially those in parts of the world where healthcare systems have been devastated by years of organized neglect, the worst is yet to come. With no hospital beds, no respirators, no mass testing, no masks, nor disinfectants, nor arrangements for placing those who are infected in quarantine, unfortunately, many will not pass through the eye of the needle. It should be noted that half a year later, though the situation is quickly deteriorating across India and is quite bad in South Africa, not to mention Brazil, Mexico, and Peru, in many poorer countries, the worst has yet to arrive. As the Oxford political scientist Simukai Chigudu has argued, contra Mbembe, the apocalyptic expectations for much of the post-colonial world were perhaps in part founded on lingering racist stereotypes, not only on epidemiological grounds. Time will of course tell, though it would certainly be misleading to suggest that Mbembe himself, one of the world's foremost post-colonial critics, was somehow motivated or perhaps duped by racist stereotypes. But back to Mbembe's impassioned plea. He continues his argument by suggesting that the COVID-19 pandemic brings us back to the body. In his words, try as we might to rid ourselves of it, in, in the end, everything brings us back to the body. We tried to graft it onto other media, to turn it into an object body, a machine body, a digital body, an ontophonic body. It returns to us now as horrifying, a horrifying giant mandible, a vehicle for contamination, a vector for pollen, spores, and mold. The next move he makes is to link the inescapability of body politics to the question of ecology, and both of these in turn to the necropolitical mechanisms of the delegation of death. As Mbembe puts the point, quote, we have never learned to live with all living species, have never really worried about the damage we as humans wreak on the lungs of the earth and on its body. Thus, we have never learned how to die. With the advent of the new world and several centuries later, the appearance of the industrialized races, we essentially chose to delegate our death to others. But there's a slow train coming up around the bend, at least according to Mbembe, who goes on to contend. Soon it will no longer be possible to delegate one's death to others. It will no longer be possible for that person to die in our place. Mbembe speaks along lines that are not all too dissimilar from Agamben about the COVID-19 pandemic as portending the death of community, since he insists, there is no community worthy of its name in which saying one's last farewell, that is, remembering the living at the moment of death, becomes impossible. And from this point, he proceeds to speak of the stranglehold, the chokehold, serendipitously perhaps, since he wrote this months before the death of George Floyd. As he eloquently puts the point, caught in the stranglehold of injustice and inequality, much of humanity is threatened by a great chokehold, as the sense that our world is in a state of reprieve spreads far and wide. Unlike Zendi, for whom there is no end in sight, Mbembe holds out hope that a day after will come, though he's quick to stress that it will only come with a giant rupture, the result of radical imagination. The first step towards this rupture is to recognize the depth of the problem we face, which he associates with our, our unprecedented social isolation. Again, in Mbembe's most evocative turn of phrase, it is time to acknowledge that on all sides we are surrounded by rings of fire. To a great extent, the digital is the new gaping hole exploding earth. Simultaneously, a trench, a tunnel, a moonscape, 
It is the bunker where men and women are all invited to hide away in isolation. But as we shall see, the point is not just about social isolation, but also about the political economy of extractivism upon which the cyberspace infrastructure relies. Even so, the point about social isolation is a serious one in its own right. According to Mbembe, just as there is no humanity without bodies, likewise, humanity will never know freedom alone outside of society and community to which he then emphatically adds, and never can freedom come at the expense of the biosphere. Here again, we see, as we already saw with Zendi, and we'll see again with Chakrabarti and with Zizek, how closely connected ruminations about the COVID-19 pandemic are with reflections on the context of the unfolding climate catastrophe in which the pandemic is taking place. For as Mbembe continues, to survive, we must return to all living things, including the biosphere, the space and energy they need. In its dank underbelly, modernity has been an interminable war of li on life, war on life, and it is far from over. One of the primary modes of this war, leading straight to the impoverishment of the world and to the des desiccation of entire swaths of the planet, is the subjugation to the digital. Though radical rupture is not relegated to the realm of the impossible by Mbembe, war would still seem to be the order of the day, along with the retrenchment of borders and the exacerbation of the brutal division of humanity along necropolitical and biopolitical lines. As Mbembe foresees, in the aftermath of this calamity, there is a danger that rather than offering sanctuary to all living species, sadly, the world will enter a new period of tension and brutality. In terms of geopolitics, the logic of power and might will continue to dominate. For lack of a common infrastructure, a vicious partitioning of the globe will intensify and the dividing lines will, be, will become even more entrenched. Many states will seek to fortify their borders in the hopes of protecting themselves from the outside. They will also seek to conceal the constitutive violence that they continue to habitually direct at the most vulnerable. Life behind screens and in gated communities will become the norm. Which brings him again to broach the subject of Africa and of the global South more generally, this time in explicit relation to the extractivist global political economic regime in which he contends it is trapped. For according to Mbembe, in Africa especially, but in many places in the global South, energy intensive extraction agricultural expansion, predatory cells of land, and destruction of forests will continue unabated. The powering and cooling of computer chips and supercomputers depends on it. This dynamic in turn is related to the retrenchment of the regime of global apartheid, in which the mobility of the vast majority of humanity remains severely restricted. Again, in, in Membe's eloquent articulation, the purveying and supplying of the resources and energy necessary for the global computing infrastructure will require further restrictions on human mobility, which leads him to his plea about breath. He makes a most brilliant observation, effectively connecting what might seem at first blush a rather disparate set of subjects. He writes, all these wars on life begin by taking away breath. Likewise, as it impedes breathing and blocks the resuscitation of human bodies and tissues, COVID-19 shares the same tendency. He continues by now coming close to a crescendo, striking an unabashed Foucauldian biopolitical and necropolitical chord, but somehow articulating at the same time a decolonized but still distinctly neo-Kantian twist. In his memorable words with his distinctive, albeit translated voice and cadence, quote, before this virus, humanity was already threatened with suffocation. If war there must be, it cannot be, it cannot so much be, against a specific virus as against everything that condemns the majority of humankind to a premature secession of breathing, everything that fundamentally attacks the respiratory tract, everything that in the long reign of capitalism has constrained entire segments of the world, population, entire races to a difficult panting breath and life of oppression. To come through this constriction would mean that we conceive of breathing beyond its purely biological aspect and instead is that which we hold in common, that which by definition eludes all calculation, by which I mean the universal right to breathe. Here is attempt to affect the giant rupture to provoke a radical reimagining re along full-throated cosmopolitan lines. For he insists such a universal right to breathe cannot be confiscated and thereby eludes all sovereignty, symbolizing the sovereign principle par excellence. Moreover, it is an originary right to, to living on earth, 
a right that belongs to the universal community of earthly inhabitants, human and other. A plea that is as urgent as its visionary author is desperate. He insists, the dangers faced by humanity are increasingly existential. He further warns, again, along biopolitical and necropolitical lines. The eugenicist temptation has not dissipated, far from it, in fact, since it is at the root of recent advances in science and technology. Though he glimpses an opening, a possibility for radical rupture in the linings of the cessation, the cessation that the pandemic has imposed, he argues, what we need is a voluntary cessation, a conscious and fully consensual interruption, without which there will be no tomorrow which brings him to a most emphatic conclusion. If indeed COVID-19 is the spectacular expression of the planetary impasse in which humanity finds itself today, then it is a matter of no less than reconstructing a habitable earth to give us all, to give all of us the breath of life. Okay, with that, we will also take another pause. <laughs>